Thanks, Maggie. Hi, thank you guys for, for coming. Um, so with this presentation, I just wanted to come up and give a couple of tips and tricks for preserving your shoulders um, because it's, it's super important for, for health reasons. Just so you guys know a, a little bit about me, my name is Magdalena Love. I go by Maggie. Uh, I'm an occupational therapist. I don't know if you guys can tell from my accent, but I'm not from Australia, from the States actually. And I just recently relocated to Sydney uh, to help out with Permobile uh, education. Um, so you guys know a little bit about Permobile. We provide wheelchairs, uh, power mobility uh, devices and wheelchairs, as well as tie light manual chairs and Rojo cushions and a few other lines as well. Uh, if you guys need have any questions, obviously we only have 30 minute time period for this quick uh, information session. So if you guys have any questions afterwards, feel free to come and find me uh, at the Permobile booth. So with this, I want to talk about the upper limb preservation guidelines. We want to talk about how the fit of a wheelchair specifically influences a lot of pushing dynamics and the forces on your shoulder. Uh, and, and then also some other techniques to preserve your shoulders uh, if you're using them full time. So the shoulder is a flexible joint. It gives us lots of range of motion, the most amount of uh, range of motion with the ball and socket joint. But with that flexibility, you also get a, a, a joint that's prone for injury. Um, and so we want to make sure that we prevent first and foremost. Now, if you are getting shoulder pain already, a couple techniques, and we'll talk about the ways of doing this. You want to rest and stop use of that extremity. Of course, if you're using your shoulders full time for everything, are you supposed to just not do anything and just go dependently? Of course not. So it's about figuring out what are the main areas that are important for their shoulders use and minimizing them as much as possible. Um, we want to modify how we perform tasks. So change the task that you're doing that could be transfers or modify how you do your pressure relief. Uh, as well as modify the environment. Maybe it means something needs to be changed, a bed height needs to be changed, a vehicle needs to be swapped out um, so, so you can modify the environment. Uh, and lastly, uh, we will, and we'll just briefly touch upon this, but we want to talk about strengthening and maintaining mobility. Why does this matter? I won't harp too much on this because most of us know why this matters. There's a huge incident of repetitive strain injuries. Say people with paraplegia have a 73% chance uh, of, of getting shoulder pain sometime throughout their lifetime. Um, the longer the time since injury, the more likely you are to get this. Uh, and it's the most commonly reported site of injury for those that are um, manual mobility users. Some of these causes, it could be the propulsion of the chair, absolutely. The shoulders really weren't designed to be your primary form of mobility. That's not how they were made, and so could be the propulsion, could be the transfer, whether it be transfer technique or the height of transfers or just doing transfers all throughout the day uh, and activities of daily living. So we use our shoulders for a lot of things. Um, and what can we do about it? The best way to start is preventing shoulder pain before it starts. Unfortunately, our healthcare system doesn't really recognize that. Our healthcare system wants to wait for you to have a problem first, and then they might think about the solution for it. But in an ideal world, we're thinking about uh, preventing these injuries from the onset and, and, and never having an incident of, of shoulder injury. There are a couple of evidence-based guidelines here. We see um, the, the Consortium of Spinal Cord Medicine has a whole booklet, a long booklet you can download um, with ways of preserving the upper limb. As well as there's a Resna position paper, and, and I think uh, one of the earlier talks talked about this as well. The Resna position paper uh, goes through kind of best practice for how to fit a wheelchair um, for preserving the shoulders. Um, it's, it's free and available online uh, as well, so if you want extra information, absolutely check that out as a resource. Just a brief note on exercise guidelines, uh, and of course if you guys need more information about this, I'm happy to talk to you guys in, in the uh, Permobile website. But overall, your goal with exercise is to stretch the overused muscles and to strengthen the opposing muscles. And so with this, you want to make sure that um, you want to stretch all of the muscles that you use to typically push the chair. So your pectoralis muscle, um, long head of the biceps, you want to be stretching those, not necessarily strengthening. Pushing the chair oftentimes will strengthen those muscles. 
you do want to strengthen the opposing muscles. And so some of the movements that you want to do uh, focus on in scapula or scapular or scapula is a, is a fancy way of, of saying shoulder blade. So you may want to retract the shoulders together, um, work on external rotation exercises, um, diagonal extension, anything to kind of strengthen these back, upper back muscles to really give, your, uh, give a good balance to the shoulder. Because when the shoulder becomes too strong in one direction, that's when you get prone for injury. Should never be painful though. So if any of these exercises become painful, obviously consult your therapist or your doctor and, uh, and, and cease that activity. At the very least, if every, every movement is painful, stretching is probably the most important. So from a history of wheelchairs, and I'm, I'm a self-proclaimed wheelchair nerd, um, but, and, and I find the history to be fascinating. We've come a long way with what we're able to provide wheelchair-wise. We still have further to go, um, but you know, we initially started out in the 1920s with these kind of basket chairs, and they were a very dependent device. They were not for promoting independence. Um, and even uh, when we got to the idea, you know, this is uh, FDR, uh, who's from the States, um, even with these wheelchairs, this was not able to be transported a lot of places. If you can kind of see the, um, the rear, uh, the, the caster is actually in the rear. So you can't do a wheelie in that, can't go over a lot of terrain with that. Um, but we got this, and then there was the development of the folding chair, which was great. Oh my gosh, you can finally actually transport this chair different places. Um, and the, uh, so we're able to do that. And then finally in the 70s and 80s, we got to the, the idea of, of changing the design of these chairs so that you can uh, get lighter weight materials, better rollability over this. And now the newest trend is to actually be able to make a custom fit chair for you, to actually fit it to the dimensions of your body so that it's able to, uh, to do that. And that's where we are now. We think, what's the most important quality uh, in a manual chair? Everybody says it, weight, right? Oh, we want the lightest weight chair, the lightest weight chair. And that comes from some really good clinical practice guidelines. What they're saying is manual wheelchairs need to be high strength, fully customizable, uh, and fit to the person. You want to forget fit across all dimensions. And so we'll go over some techniques for, for making sure that your chair is fit correctly to give you the best opportunity to be able to push this chair in different environments. There's two types of manual chairs available on the market right now. We've got folding chairs and we have rigid chairs. Of course, we think about folding chairs. Initially, they were developed, again, that Everest and Jennings one that in the 1930s. It increases transportability. However, with that increased transportability, you get more play in the system and additional components that add weight to the chair. So there is a trade-off in that sense. And if we think about, oh, wait, 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 weight is the most important thing. Um, a lot of times, if you look at the brochure for any of the, the, the manufacturers here, we list transport weight. It's just simply the, the frame. It doesn't include the wheels, the components. The components can weigh a lot in these chairs, so make sure you're choosing those components very carefully when it comes to that. And also the fit of the chair is super important. If you are trying to push even the lightest weight chair and it's not configured for you, that can be more difficult than, than pushing a slightly heavier chair that fits you better biomechanically. I won't go too much into this because I want to make sure that we get into uh, some of the assistive devices, but there's a lot of components that you can customize on these chairs. And those different components influence things like rolling resistance, stability, transportability, the footprint of the chair. So these are highly customizable pieces of equipment. And when they're not properly fitted, sometimes you don't know. A lot of times you don't know. You, this is the only chair you've had, or it's always been like this. Um, but overall, this can lead to discomfort and long-term pain. So we want to make sure that we're thinking along these lines. These axles are also adjustable, so the main thing is to figure out where the axle should be placed to give the most amount of stability and, uh, and the least amount of forces when you're pushing the chair. Generally speaking, I see people sitting very, very high in the chair. Uh, you know, and we see even in marketing materials here that the people are positioned way, way high. 
we want to make sure that you have enough gear so that when you are propelling the chair, you're actually able to get your hands along the wheel and get a good push stroke uh, and recovery technique. Generally speaking, my rule of thumb is I really want to position the fingertips to the palm above the center of the axle. So if you relax your hand on down, you want to be over that axle and then also make sure that you're low enough in the chair to give you stability. We look at research here as well about where the axle is placed. The most commonly placed position for the axle was actually um, number, uh, no, or the, the, not the most commonly, sorry. Um, the, the axle is best when placed in position one. So in position one, where the axle, it's kind of hard to think about, but it's high up and forward, it, in, it decreases the amount of torsion forces needed to, to propel the chair. However, most commonly, it was placed in position three, which makes it the hardest to push. We also have to think a little bit about camber. Sometimes adding a bit of camber for different body types can be very, very beneficial. And so having it angle inwards can really help with the maneuverability. However, we have to think also with camber, whenever you increase camber, you are increasing the width of the chair. So that can be a trade-off as well. We want to make sure we're maximizing the fit, minimizing forces, and minimizing the frequency of any shoulder stuff. So some other tips and tricks for modifying tasks. Make sure you're getting the right technique with transfers. You don't want your hands facing inwards. You want to have them outwards, but not past 30. So kind of at that just a little bit outward facing direction when you're doing transfers. Um, you want to lead with your more painful arm. So if you have a one painful shoulder, make sure you're leading with the less painful arm because there's more torsion forces on that trailing arm when you're doing a transfer. Um, for pressure relief, we no longer are recommending that you do a push-up weight shift transfer. You may want to do a leaning forward transfer, so go ahead and you know, touch your toes or do that to relieve pressure as opposed to pushing up and using your shoulders and holding it for a minute. Um, carry object close to the body. Um, so just a couple of tips and tricks. I don't have a magic button that's able to fix shoulder pain, unfortunately. Um, it's just something that you, know, you have to compensate for as things go on. The other thing is propulsion um, dynamics. So when you're pushing, there's, uh, they did a bunch of studies here and it's been shown in the research. There's a couple different techniques to pushing a manual chair. The most common technique that people use is going to be that single loop over. So that's when you push and then your hand goes up and over, push goes up and over. However, they see the actual, the best one for your shoulder would be that semicircular push. So that you're able to contact the chair and then let your arm rest as it travels back to contact the chair again. That's going to be the most biomechanically appropriate way of pushing the chair. Um, the worst one would be the one where you've got your hand always on the hand rim and you're dragging your hands. You're actually uh, increasing the friction on, on, the, on the chair and slowing yourself down during that push along with the repetitive motion. Tips for modifying the environment. You want to try to set up as many level transfers as possible. I had one person that was like, but what about downhill transfers? I love downhill transfers. Of course, but for every downhill transfer, there's an uphill transfer. And so if you're setting up your environment, you want to make sure to keep them as level as possible. Um, again, strengthen and maintain the flexibility. Um, ensure that the wheelchair is fit appropriately and keep your tires inflated. I know there's a, a, something going on in the States right now. You know, you're, you're, if you keep your tires inflated, you use less gas. Um, because your car rolls better. Same thing goes for wheelchairs. Keep these tires inflated because that's going to really significantly influence the ease of pushing the chair. Um, and then rest or stop moving. Well, obviously, a lot of us can't just not use our shoulders. But it's our main way of getting around. Um, but, you know, you can modify the environment or ask for help at certain times to, to make sure you're not making it worse. And so here's what I think is the, the fun part here is we're going to talk a little bit about power assistive devices. And this is another way of modifying your equipment. So having an, an assistive device, again, with our medical model, a lot of times it's not funded until you have a problem. However, I kind of wish in an ideal world we could get this for even people that are newly injured so we can hopefully prevent injuries from happening down, down the road. 
Um, so you, when I was back working in an OT and, and as an OT at a spinal cord injury center in Texas, pretty much one of the only options we had was the, the e-motion wheels, which um, are, have little sensors that are activated in the hand rim. So when it senses you press a little bit, it will amplify that movement. But since then, there's been a lot of new products that have come onto the market. Um, the one I've got up here uh, is, is the ZX1. I'm getting used to saying Z now. Um, and so we've got the ZX1, which actually it can be used for rigid frame chairs, uh, and you can use a joystick to drive. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's heavy in that sense, but what you can do is operate it that way, and then whoop. There we go, there we go, pulling the wrong thing. And then just slide out, and then when you want to, back in. And then get to driving. So a nifty option. And the other one that I'm gonna have Malcolm uh, go ahead and demonstrate would be the smart drive. And so that is for both rigid frame and, uh, and cross, uh, and uh, folding chairs. There's different adapters, um, and so I'll let you talk about it. So what I've got, this is yeah, I'm going I'm to give you the microphone. microphone. So the smart drive, whoa, that's loud, uh, sits on the back of the chair. It's removable, so I can lift it on and off. Uh, it just sits on a, a simple clamp onto the camber bar. And I've got, a, I've got a wristband on that I just turn on, and it actually connects wirelessly to the smart drive. So to activate the smart drive, all I do is push, and now um, the smart drive's actually powering me. I don't have to push again. Uh, it's nice, it's free floating, so I can do this. And to stop it, I simply tap on my, on my hand. So for anyone that couldn't hear, so the smart drive is, is powering, so as soon as he pushes off, as soon as he pushes off, then it's actually powering the chair. He's using resistance um, placed upon one side of the hand rim in order to turn, so he slows down one wheel as he turns around. He also has a Bluetooth connected wristband that when he taps it, it disengages the motor, so the motor will stop and then he can stop the chair as you normally would stop the chair. And one of the nice things with this is I can control my speed. So my initial push determines how fast it's going to go. So I can and I'm going slower. If I want to go fast, a quicker push, that'll get me going faster. So the tap again disengages. Um, it's brilliant because I can have this in my car get my chair out. If I know that I'm going to need it, I can put it on. If I don't need it, I don't put it on. If I'm not sure, I can put it on and I can still push my chair uh, the normal, normally as if I didn't have it on there. So it's a really good option. And just, just if I can tell a little story. Yeah, just let's go ahead. <laughs> when I first got this, um, the inventor is a guy called Mark Richer. So he asked me, would I like to try this? I said, yeah, I'd love to try this, but the condition is you have to come to Germany and there's a big expo on in Germany, you have to wheel around in Germany with it on. So, okay, that sounds like a deal. So on my way, I went to London. I used to live in London playing wheelchair basketball and I used to love going for a walk along the Thames. So I thought, I'm, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna have a walk along the Thames and see how I go. So I was pushing along and I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push without putting the smart drive on, because I've got the power when I, when I turn around and come back. So I found I actually went a few k's further than I normally would. When I turned back, I started with the smart drive, and it, what I did, there's all these little bridges and roads and alleyways, and I started thinking, oh man, I've never gone over that bridge, because it was really steep. <laughs> so I started to explore little nooks and crannies of, crannies of London that I've never, I've never been to it before started to look for good food in London, which I never did find. But it, what it did is just opened up my whole environment. 
and I found that in Sydney and wherever I go now, that I'm more inclined to go places because I'm not, I'm not so worried about getting sore uh, shoulders. My wife says, let's go for a walk in the botanical gardens. I'm like, yeah, that'd be cool because I'm not going to have to be you know, sweating, pushing up all those hills all the time. So it's actually opened up the whole, my whole kind of community where I can go. Uh, awesome. Would you show really quick how you take it off? Um, you'll have to do it. Okay. I, I actually can't take it off when I'm sitting in the chair, so I have to do it from within yeah. the chair. So in order to take it off, all you have to do is lift it up, and then um, it will pop off very easy to take off, so then uh, it, it can just be put in the car before transport. So then the other thing is, it adds no, no weight onto my existing chair, so I just have a small clamp on my camber bar, so I'm not adding anything onto my chair really to accommodate that. And the majority of the weight actually rests on the ground, so it's not adding a ton of weight to the chair, even if it is off and attached, because it, the, it's rolling along the ground. You also see there's a little bit of roller wheels. That's to allow it to be able to move side to side well. So I'm, I'm low on time, so let's go ahead and if there's any questions. Just quickly, if I can. Maggie oh, yeah. talked about the setup of your chair. Really important. So one of the things I find with this, even though it adds a bit of weight to my chair, when my chair is set up properly, I don't actually notice it when it's on and I haven't gone too long. Perfect. How much does it weigh yep. is the question. So the In unit kilos. itself is, a, is about 4.5 4 kilos. Can you put them on another chair? You, you need it by the chair as well or can you just put them on any chair? Pretty much any chair. So you can put it on folding chairs, rigid frame. There's a adapter that goes onto a folding chair. It's a little bit, it's a little bit more tricky than the. Yeah. So the question was, are there a change in mounts? Yeah, it comes with a little kit. So yes. depending on the diameter of your axle or uh, the, the the width of your chair, there's different um, brackets that are available, and they come with every unit. So for different for different brands, you mean? Yep. Yeah. I've got the same. So I've got I've got an old chair at home that's got the mount got the mount on. I've got this chair as well. So you, you could you could have several mounts on several chairs and just use it on on all the different chairs. Uh, cost and the duration and can you get up a curb with that? Yes. Um, cost I think is about eight and a half thousand um, retail. Um, duration, you're talking about battery, how long, how far you can go? Or, yeah. Yep. Yep. So depending on the terrain and the, and the hilliness, you'll get anywhere from 14 to 17 k's out of the duration of it. Um, and can you get up curbs? Yep, you can. So you can bounce down curbs. It does free flow. So free flow. All right. So, what yeah, so you can get up and down curbs. Yep. One thing okay. for any, any therapists or, or, or clients that are interested in this, this is simply kind of in addition to your standard wheelchair skills. It is not going to improve a wheelie. It won't inhibit you from dealing a wheelie. Um, so whatever wheelchair skills that you have, it's not going to affect those, but it's also not going to be you know, a replacement for anti-tips or anything like that. It's not, it's not an anti-tip. Anti an anti-tip. Anti-tip. My, my American, goodness gracious. In your presentation there, on slide two or three, you were talking about best clinical guidelines for, um, for shoulders. Mm -hmm. Could you go back to that? Which display? one? The second or third one that was talking about the... Um, They're the... The Vesna, the, the Vesna page. Which one? I think the Vesna and the PDA. Oh, yeah. So, so one of the guidelines comes from Resna, one comes from the uh, Veterans Affairs over in the uh, US. I, I really do love the, the Resna Position Guide. It stands for, um, there we go. Um, this one? 
So the Resna position stands for Rehab Engineering Society of North America, and I know that's not where we are, but it is a bunch of rehab engineers and therapists and physicians that get together, read a bunch of research articles, and translate it to something that you guys can read and understand and not have to have a degree in statistics to understand. Uh, so I, I definitely suggest looking this up um, as well, and if you guys go to the Permbill website, we have it um, It's a that. free download. It is a free download. I just Google it every time. Like Resna position paper wheelchair and then pull it up and download it. Do we have any other questions? How long does the battery last? Uh, yeah, so so the battery lasts depending on the terrain, anywhere from you know fourteen to seventeen, eighteen Ks. So and you can charge it overnight, so pretty much how many years? How many years? This is a high tech. This is a lithium ion phosphate battery. Uh, I've, the battery I've got is at three years, still going fine. They're, they're graded to something like 20 years of recharges. So they, the battery will keep going for, for a long time. Yeah. Um, they go up hills, but they don't go down. Is that correct? They go, they go down hills, but they don't break assist down. So, um, yeah, there's no break assist going down hills. So if you need a break assist going down hills, this is not the right product. It's a great product, but like all products, it's not for everybody. Yep. So if you need a break assist going down hills, then maybe the power assist wheels or something like the ZX1 that we're looking at there. So I always... I always turn this off going downhill. So the power assist wheels there, E-Motion wheels are probably the biggest brand. Um, have you got a photo of them? Yes. Just scroll through this. So these are the power assist wheels. So. They fit onto your chair, and when you push, they, they can maximise your push, so they'll, they'll assist your push, and they'll also give you some brake assist going down hills. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know to tell the truth, but I think yeah. they're up around that twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure about the price either. All right, if, if you guys want, uh, have any questions or want to take a closer look, we've got uh, an extra smart drive that is not mouse at the Permobile booth, uh, and, and I'd love to follow up with any questions. Thank you, guys. Thanks to the Permobile team. That was a great presentation. Thank you.